So in this video, I'm going to dig into the details of 802.11 or Wi-Fi, what its packet formats look like, how it uses different, how it uses different media access control algorithms, and sort of an overview of Wi-Fi itself. So recall when we were talking about physical layers and coding, I mean different modulation schemes, uh, that something like 802.11n has a whole bunch of different speeds it can operate at. So here's just a limited set. Um, of a very, actually a reasonably small subset of the ways in which an 802.11n link can work. And so there's a thing, MCS index, this is actually a field in the packet, and it tells you for the data portion of a packet uh, how that data portion is modulated um, and how it's coded. And so in practice, 802.11n is used everything from binary phase shift keying up to 64 quadrature amplitude modulation with coding schemes from one half to five sixths. And this means that the actual range of data speeds that you see for an 802.11n link, which is going to adapt based on the observed signal to noise ratio, um, is from, and this is just a subset, it actually goes faster, as we'll see in a future video on MIMO, um, from 6.5 megabits per second to 150 megabits per second. And so this is a factor of you know, over 20 difference between the speeds. And so Wi-Fi 802.11n is able to, depending on what the spectrum is like, depending on what timing is like, is able to adapt across a huge range of speeds so that it can adapt its link based on the channel conditions. Compare this to a wired system where because the signal to noise ratio is fixed based on the medium, um, you just have a fixed speed that you're going to operate at, which is the fastest speed the other side can do. So you imagine this is kind of a challenge, which is that Wi-Fi, depending on the signal-to-noise ratio that it observes the channel conditions, wants to be able to operate at this huge range of bit rates. And so how does this work? And so this is down occurring at the, the physical and link layer. And so what happens is, this is what the 802.11b physical layer looks like. Um, so here, there's this physical layer header, which starts with some synchronization bits. This is what allows the other side to detect, oh, this is actually a Wi-Fi signal. This isn't just junk. Um, so there's a series of synchronization bits, followed by 16 bits that denote, OK, it's no longer synchronization. This is the, what's called the SFD, or start of frame delimiter. So there's this particular sequence of bits you expect. Um, then there's a start of frame delimiter de denoting that the synchronization is over, because it might be you started, say, in the middle of the synchronization. You don't know when it's going to end. And then after that, there's a series of 48 bits. Um, denoting the signal, the service, the length, um, and the CRC uh, of this physical layer um, chunk. All of this is being scrambled uh, by the physical layer using uh, forward error correction, coding, interleaving, all those kinds of techniques that will be robust to bit errors. Now, of course, you need to get this. Uh, in its entirety before you can start necessarily pulling the link frame apart because you just need to say no what the length is. So that's the physical layer. Then in the link frame, we have a whole bunch of fields. So there's the frame control field. This gives you sort of control information about the frame, what it's like. There's duration. This tells you how long this packet or things about it are going to take. This is really important if, say, uh, the data rate is higher than you can uh, demodulate, like you don't have the high enough signal to noise ratio. So this duration is sent you know how long this packet or this exchange is going to be. It's a way to tell the nodes, hey, this is how long it's going to take. Uh, there can be up to four addresses uh, embedded in the header. Um, often you just have a two addressing mode. Oh, there's the source and there's the destination. But there are other things you can do, say you want to bridge across networks, etc. There's a sequence number. Um, then there's the network data, what's coming in from the network layer. And then finally, uh, a frame check sequence. So think of this like a CRC. It's a four byte uh, frame check sequence. So let's look at these first two fields, the frame control and duration. Now what these are used for, as I was saying, is the duration field tells listeners, other nodes that can hear the packet, and also the recipient, how long this packet or packet exchange is going to take. So then that way, even if they can't understand those packets because they're too fast, they know how long it's going to take. And they can use this for something called virtual carrier sense. The idea here is recall that in the CSMA-CA algorithm, a node will count down while the channel is busy. Now, it could detect the channel is busy directly by listening, or it could detect the channel is busy virtually by being told that it is. 
So this duration field, for example, is what a CTS packet uses to tell nodes around it, hey, clear to send, I, you know, your channel is busy for this long because I'm going to be receiving something and so you shouldn't transmit. So another thing the 802.11 header can do is essentially virtualize a link. So think we have these three addresses. So I'm not going to go into the fourth one. Let's just consider these three. So this is the case where if I want to have an AP act uh, more like a switch, say, than an independent link layer device to which a packet is destined. So in this case, I can tell, hey, I'd like to send this is, you know, I'd like to send a packet from adder one to adder two via adder three. This is a way of telling the AP, aha, you know, I'd like to send a packet to this other link layer address um, through you. So you can sort of virtualize that link of the access point. And so give the nodes that are connected wirelessly virtual access to the wired network sitting behind the AP. So one of the things that we saw with RTS-CTS is that depending on the speed that you use, uh, RTS-CTS, these control packets, could have a significant overhead up to 25% at 11 megabits for 802.11b. And this all comes down to the fact that because 802.11 has this huge range of bit rates, but it needs to be backwards compatible, this means that, say, these, this physical region, the physical uh, frame header, needs to be comprehensible by everyone listening. So I can't, if I'm a transmitter, I can't transmit the physical header at my full speed. So if I'm operating at 1 megabit or 600 megabits, I still need to transmit this header at the same speed so that everyone can understand it. Um, same with things like the duration field. And so the way to think about this is that because the slowest link is, say, 1 megabit per second, I need to transmit this that everyone operating perhaps even at one megabit per second can understand it. Then the data region may maybe will save you 600 megabits per second, so tiny, tiny, tiny. But this, this initial control sequence is still going to remain the same length. And so in practice, what this means is that as Wi-Fi speeds get faster and faster and faster, right? So you can imagine if I have uh, a slow speed, then the data. This is at one megabit, this is slow. Here's control. Here's data. The control is small compared to the data. But as I make the data region faster and faster, here's data, which, which is faster, control, or faster, it can be, in fact, that the control, here's data, here's control, can be the dominant duration of the packet. These bits are sent so slowly compared to the data region, um, say at the, upper, at the network layer, that all of my airtime is consumed by these control headers. And so people at Microsoft Research have done some you know, analysis of this and have shown that, look, when you're operating up at 600 megabits per second in terms of the fastest 802.11 speed, 802.11n that you can do today, um, this control sequence is 92 percent of your airtime. That is, you're only spending 8% of your time actually sending data. So you can imagine, even if you double your data rate, you're not going to actually double your throughput because you're going to go from consuming 8% of the time to 4% of the time. It's still then 96% of your airtime will be consumed with control traffic. And so there's this diminishing returns. So 802.11 is this basic Mac format. It's designed to work on top of many physical layers, many modulations, many speeds. But part of that is that it needs to have backwards compatibility. So rather than, say, talk about the uh, uh, number of bytes that this packet's going to last, it talks about how long this packet's going to last in time. So that even if you don't know what the modulation scheme is because it's some future version of Wi-Fi that your device doesn't talk, it knows how long the packet will be. Um, Mac control, things like the control to send packet, um, are done in terms of durations. There's this duration field where it can say, hey, the channel around me needs to be clear for this number of microseconds. It also allows you to virtualize a link right, by embedding additional addresses that you can actually bridge between the wired and the wireless Ethernet. And so while we read all this about faster and faster Wi-Fi, you know, 600 megabits per second, in practice, it's not actually getting that fast. Uh, and the reason being that these control headers that are needed for backwards compatibility and for interoperability just end up consuming all of your airtime. 
And so the actual observed data throughput on a 600 megabit per second Wi-Fi link is far, far, far below 600 megabits per second. It's probably closer to at most, you know, 50 megabits per second.